so happy we alive. A design of a robotic red blood cell. The red blood cells is something we have reverse engineered. We understand how they work. And it brings up an interesting observation about biology, which is on the one hand, it's very intricate and complex. On the other hand, it's very suboptimal. Biology made certain assumptions early in evolution that it can't revisit, like building everything out of proteins, until it gets to the point where it designed a species that's intelligent enough to go back and re-engineer biology. And this is a good example of that. These robotic red blood cells are about a thousand times more powerful than your biological red blood cells. And a conservative analysis indicated if you replace 10% of your red blood cells with these respirocytes, or robotic red blood cells, you could do an Olympic sprint for 15 minutes without taking a breath, or sit at the bottom of your pool for four hours. So, uh, honey, I'm in the pool, will take on a whole new meaning. And it'll be interesting to see what we do in our Olympic contests. And you might say, well, we'll ban them. Then we'll have the specter of high school kids in their gymnasiums routinely outperforming the Olympic athletes. But uh, it's not clear we should ban them. In fact, I don't think we should. We should ban steroids because the reason is steroids are bad for your health. If you don't ban them, then you're forcing athletes to do something that's bad for their health in order to be competitive. And they feel that pressure anyway. But these actually will be good for your health. They'll lead to better oxygenation of your tissues. You'll be able to survive, let's say, stop the stopping of your heart for hours rather than minutes and so on, uh, we will ultimately go beyond normal human capabilities, physically and mentally. And to come back to our exponential growth of computing, is the computers of the 20th century projected to the 21st century. Uh, we'll have supercomputers that are as powerful as human brain, at least as far as hardware computation is concerned by 2010. $1,000 of computation will match human brain by 2020. And this is really a mainstream view when people have studied this. We'll have plenty of computation, speed and memory in computers to simulate the human brain. But then the question is, will we have the software? Or, or will these just be very fast calculators? And the secrets of human intelligence, the methods, the content, the, the algorithms are not hidden from us. Uh, the, the primary source for understanding how human intelligence works will be understanding the human brain itself, and it's not hidden from us. But actually, a few years ago, it was hidden from us. You've probably seen, in, they appear in magazines, fMRI images inside the human brain. They're quite interesting, but they're not good enough to actually understand how the brain works. Someone's solving a logic problem, you see this spot in their brain light up, and so we get the idea that this part of the brain is responsible for that activity, but that doesn't tell you the methods that that part of the brain is using to do this type of, of cognitive processing. But the spatial resolution of brain scanning, as I mentioned earlier, is doubling every year. I talked about five or six emerging technologies where you can actually see now, for the first time, individual interneuronal connections, see them firing in real time, and we can actually see now for the first time, just within the last few years, our brain create our thoughts. And we can also actually see our thoughts create our brain, because as we think about something, we're actually creating new connections, that's how we learn. And if you study a particular subject, you're actually creating new brain matter, reflecting that information. And you can see that now. And we're getting enough information to, to actually watch this process in real time. But then another question comes up. Can we understand this information? Uh, these show the, the exponential growth in, in brain scanning. But, and the amount of information we're getting about the brain is doubling every year. But a key question is, can we understand this information? Maybe we're not smart enough to understand it. Doug Hofstadter has for years said, well, maybe and probably our intelligence is just below that threshold to understand our intelligence. And if we were smarter and able to understand it, well, then necessarily our brain would be that much more complicated and we'd never catch up with And maybe there's a mathematical theorem about that, that a system, complex system can't be complex enough to understand its own complexity. It will never catch its own tail. That's not what we're finding. If we get enough data about specific regions of the brain, we find that we can actually reverse engineer them. This has been done actually for 20 different regions of the brain out of the several hundred that exist. This is a block diagram of a dozen regions of the auditory cortex that have been modeled in precise mathematical terms and simulated 
And then we can test the simulation. They've applied sophisticated psychoacoustic tests to the simulation. They get very similar tests, the results, applying the same test to human auditory perception. Uh, there's a simulation of the cerebellum, which is where we do our skill formation. And this is an important region. It comprises more than half the neurons in the brain. And this is past tests comparable to human skill formation. And it brings up an interesting question, which is, how complex is the human brain? Well, if you look at the human brain, the mature human brain, it looks very complex. And in fact, I've estimated it would take thousands of trillions of bytes of information to characterize the state of every ion channel and neurotransmitter concentration and, and all the interneural connections and so on. And, that, and that's a lot of complexity. But the design of the human brain is a billion times simpler than that. Well, how do we know that? Well, the design of the human brain is in the genome. And the genome doesn't have that much information in it. It's three billion rungs, and six billion bits, which is 800 million bytes. However, it's replete with redundancies. There's one sequence called ALU, it's a lengthy sequence. It's repeated 300,000 times. So there's a technique called data compression, which is used on things like video signals, where if there's redundancy in the information, you can compress it without actually losing any information, because you can reconstruct it. So if you apply this lossless data compression, because of the redundancy, to the genome, it, it gets compressed to 30 to 50 million bytes. That's less than Microsoft Word. Now, you might wonder, well, how, how could that be? I mean, how can something that's 30 to 50 million bytes describe an entity that ends up being a billion times more complicated than that? Well, we, we see a lot of examples of that in science and engineering. You may have seen images like this. This is called the Mandelbrot set. And it's an example of a very complex image. In fact, it's on the cover of a book called Complexity. And it looks pretty complex. And it actually takes millions of bytes of data to represent the image. And as you zoom in on the image and look at finer regions of it, you see complexity within complexity. So it's a lot of complexity there. But the design of this Mandelbrot set is six letters long. I mean, that's the formula for the Mandelbrot set. And it's iteratively applied, and the image gets more and more complex, but it's a six-letter design. And that's, that really describes well the relationship of the genome to the brain. Take, take the, the cerebellum, for example. If I showed you a cerebellum, and I'd say, here, reverse engineer this, and I showed you the cerebellum, and you saw these trillions of connections deeply intertwined, looking very, very complex, you go, well, this is ridiculous. We'll never be able to figure this out. It'll take hundreds of years. Well, we actually have figured it out. It's not that complex. There's only a few genes that control it. There's only a few tens of thousands of bytes in the design of the cerebellum. And basically, the genome says the following about the cerebellum. It says, take these four different types of neurons, organize them like so for one module. Now repeat that 10 billion times and add a little bit of random variation with each repetition within the following constraints. So that's a summary of what the genome says about the cerebellum. And then you have this cerebellum, few tens of thousands of bytes of design information, trillions of connections, largely randomly wired, but in a particular clever way. And the child then learns to walk and to talk and to catch a fly ball, and it gets filled up with meaningful information because it's a self-organizing system that responds to its environment. That's really key to the magic of the, the design of the human brain. But the, so my point is not that the brain is simple or that the design is simple, but that it is at a level of complexity that we can understand, that we are understanding. And there's also a, a model and simulation of the visual cortex, the early uh, steps in processing visual information, which actually were quite surprising, because early, early in the processing of the information that hits your eyes and then the retina and then the optic nerve, the information gets reduced to seven very low resolution movies. One looks at edges, another looks at other types of features, but these are very, very sparsely coded. And that's all, that, that's all the information that ever reaches the rest of the brain. So we essentially hallucinate the world that we think we see <laughs> because the brain is not getting this rich, detailed information that, that hits our eyes. And we, we harness uh, information from our memories and things that we've seen before. So we're well on the way towards reverse engineering the brain. We're in the early stages of this.